Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the First Church. If this is your first time you've walked in here this weekend, or welcome back to the First Church if you've been somewhere else, uh, thank you for coming. And um, I think we've finished with the tours for the time being, so we're now ready to start for the panel. And you should have in your hands a program which largely is a panelist that we did not uh, get to bring to, bring to you uh, Bob Campbell, the former architecture critic for the Globe, and the person interviewing him also could not make it because of health reasons today. He was the person that organized this panel. Anyway, my name is Edmund Robinson. I'm the minister of the church and sort of coordinator of this 50th anniversary. And this is the last event, well, not quite the last event in the 50th anniversary, because there will be a tour after this, I believe, uh, one or two possibly two tours, uh, so if you, get your, uh, if you get your curiosity whetted by this panel discussion, then um, you can have a chance to look at the, the reality that it refers to. So I want to turn this over, since Justin Beale is not able to be here, uh, I want to turn this over to Eric Howler, who is going to take us through this uh, discussion of this building in the context of Paul Rudolph's work and uh, modernism in general. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, well, good afternoon, welcome everybody. Uh, so excited to be in this space with all of you and to uh, sit with this fantastic group. My name's Eric Howler, I'm not Justin Beale. Uh, unfortunately, Justin couldn't make it up from New York um, and I'm your plan B moderator. Um, so um, I wanted to quickly introduce our panelists uh, and then I wanted to lead a little bit of a discussion. I have a few points I'd like to make with the group uh, and then open it up to the uh, audience. Um, so maybe just introducing the panelists. All the way on my left is um, Timothy Rohan. He's an associate professor of American and European architecture at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the author of The Architecture of Paul Rudolph, Yale University Press, uh, 2014. Um, Timothy uh, was one of the first scholars to examine the Paul Rudolph uh, papers and he helped organize those in the Library of Congress. So curious to see what he saw uh, or to hear about that. Um, he's been involved with a number of publications on Paul Rudolph, including Reassessing Rudolph uh, and others. Uh, I remember reading in Gray Room issue number one, a wonderful essay of Timothy's on Rudolph's drawings and his 
material and the kind of relationship between the materiality of the building and the way Rudolph used to draw. So um, I'm very excited to have Timothy here. Um, Kelvin Dickerson is here to my left. He's the president and CEO of the Paul Rudolph Institute of Modern Architecture. Uh, as I understand it, Kelvin works in Paul Rudolph's building. He looks out of Rudolph's windows every day. Um, and I'm also very excited to meet him and um, hear his perspectives uh, on, on the legacy of, of Rudolph's work and, and its sort of persistence uh, in the presence, if we should say. Um, Alice D. Friedman is the Grace Slack McNeil Professor of American Art at Wellesley College, where she focuses on modern architecture and design history. Uh, her books include Women and the Making of the Modern Home. I heard something about poker faces, private spaces. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, she also works uh, and teaches in a Paul Rudolph building uh, at Wellesley. So um, I'd love to hear the perspective sort of from the inside of that um, building. Um, and maybe about me very quickly, uh, I'm no Paul Rudolph expert. I would say I'm an admirer, uh, enthusiast. Uh, I've walked by this building many times. Uh, I've peeked in a couple uh, and um, I'm actually an associate professor of architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where I teach courses in construction. I'm also the director of thesis, and I teach in the third semester design studio uh, course sequence. Uh, I'm also a uh, founder and principal of my own firm, Haller and Yoon Architecture, here in Boston. Um, so maybe to start us off, um, I wanted to just note the space that we're in. Um, I think we've been sort of uh, looking at it all, all morning. Some of you were here last night. Um, when I teach a course at the GSD uh, called Cases in Contemporary Construction, I say it's a course about looking at architecture. It's about looking carefully. Um, and I ask my students to look carefully at buildings, not just online, because everyone can Google a building, um, but can you go up to a building and sort of observe it carefully? Uh, can you sort of discern what the design intent might have been and how that design intent could have been translated into something material and tactile and physical? So. I wanted to invite our panelists to quickly maybe reflect on something that they noticed, a detail, a moment in the building, and maybe direct our attention towards it for a moment so that we can all look together um, at the space of our kind of object of inquiry that we're kind of within today. So um, maybe I could ask Alice if you would start with uh, something that you've seen here that uh, you want to call our attention to. Sure. Um, is This is on? Good. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming on this beautiful day. Um, and it's a perfect day to talk about light um, and the light of the spirit, which is very much present here. And I want to thank you all for coming and thank you for inviting us. Um, I, um, the thing that I notice in looking carefully at this building is the presence of history, which is a funny thing to say about a modern building. but. Um, whether you look from the street, of course, you see that Rudolph, unlike the sort of stereotypical modernist, um, did not believe in eliminating the presence of history, but um, reflecting and highlighting and thinking about the presence of history, which I would, you know, I think is quite striking in this building. It has two towers, and um, you're very much aware, I think, despite the fact that there are so many beautiful modern flourishes, which we'll touch on uh, soon. Um, I think that was the thing that struck me the most because often mo modernists are accused of, um, you know, the sort of egotism uh, that would require them to eliminate all that went before. But that is certainly not the case here at all. And it's, I would say, very typical of Rudolf at this moment, and it's certainly very much the case with the building I teach in at Wellesley College, the Jewett Art Center. Yeah, and thank you, and thank you um, for this welcome this morning to a place that I've visited many times over the years, going back 20, 25 years, um, but I've been really enchanted by this visit. I was here last night for the concert, and I was here this morning for, for the wonderful service, and I'm here now. And um, for me, and the reason why I wanted to do this is because I wanted to see the, pe the building with people in it. I'd always seen it nearly empty on previous occasions. And that set off, that triggered a whole set of associations for me because, because I also went to another church service this morning. I went to Trinity Church. I am holier than thou. And, um, 
and I went because I stayed overnight. I had never been to a service in Trinity Church, and I thought, this is my opportunity. And I saw it with not so many people, but I still got to see it with people, and I was very moved by that. But I also was captivated by, I was looking at the ornament of Trinity Church, and there is so much of it, and it is so beautiful. And, um, and I kept thinking about ornament. I was thinking about Rudolph, and then I came back here, and I, I had been thinking about ornament for a, lo a long time in the past. Eric mentioned an, al an article I wrote 20 years ago um, where I kind of proposed that the, um, I did propose that the, um, his treatment of masonry surfaces, these striations, this is a type of ornament. It's a type of new modernist ornament. And I think Rudolph, as Alice mentioned, really liked historical buildings. He was not a modernist who wanted to knock them all down. He did not want to abandon history. He was really interested in picking up historical threads. And so I was thinking that this is a new type of ornament. I was comparing it to Trinity's ornament. And then finally I came back to people and I was thinking that what people often have said in the past for buildings like the Paris Opera, is that the people are the ornament. When the people are inside, they are moving, and they are part of the ornament. And so we're all um, lovely ornaments, kind of enriching this space. So that's what I was thinking about. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me here and allowing me to speak. Um, I, as you had mentioned earlier, actually work in a Paul Rudolph building in New York City. And I'm always fascinated to see how different his buildings are. I'm in a building that's primarily built out of steel and lots of glass and lots of windows. And it happens to be a lighting company that Rudolph founded in the, around the same period that this, build, uh, this church was built. Um, he was always interested in lighting. And so your mention of lighting, I think, is really curious because he was fascinated by two types. The first type had to be with a bare light bulb or the light as an object itself, the, the bulb. And then the second was reflected light, which he thought was the, quote, most humane, unquote, that he called it. And I think this is a perfect example of his use of the lighting as a reflected light. And he does that a lot in his churches. And I also think that it's fascinating that he also had a very famous quote that there needs to be less fishbowls and more caves because he grew up in a period where he was critiquing modern architecture for being too much glass and too much transparent and he wanted things to be more solid. And I think that it's interesting that this church, which reminds me a lot of Tuskegee, which he also did, is known for being less windows and more actual walls. And I think that that actually makes the space feel warmer because the light washes over this um, wonderful surface. And I also want to re am reminded that when I came to see it for the first time, there was a really nice guy with a ponytail that let me in for three hours to crawl all over the building and take pictures. And I just remembered that, and that was the first thing I thought of when I saw this space, because I remembered him letting me in and taking a look and just letting me loose. Nice. Thanks. Thanks for those reflections. Um, I, I also had some uh, observations. The first thing I noticed when I walked in was the kind of shimmer of the copper between the verticals. Um, I, I understand that. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Is that better? Okay. Apologies. Um, when I first stepped in, I noticed the copper in between the striations, and I thought, is there a fire in there? Is there? Am I looking at a fireplace or something? And it, it looked animated, um, and that was kind of incredible. I understand that's not Paul Rudolph's intent, or that wasn't his design, but it's still part of the church, and so. It's a church that can incorporate other authors and other uh, layers of information on top of it. So I think that's, that's a beautiful uh, moment. This morning I was watching the light move across the corrugated um, uh, mod, um, masonry units here, and, and I was like, what is that light over there? Because the edge is not a straight line. It's kind of, it's kind of uh, like a paintbrush. It's kind of brushed light. Um, uh, and Reverend Robinson referred to weaving of light and darkness this morning, and I thought that was really beautiful how the architecture does that as the light moves, that it's, it's weaving uh, of light and darkness. So um, just a couple of moments that I noticed this morning, and I do think the best architecture invites us to look and look again and look more carefully uh, at, at the spaces we inhabit, and I think Rudolph was a kind of master of that. Um, maybe I could... Um, shift a little bit the conversation from like the moment that we're in and obs observations that we have to um, maybe a bit of the historical trajectory of this building. Um, we're here at the 50th anniversary, which is uh, wonderful. Um, and 
And as I understand it, this building was uh, designed between 1969 and constructed in 1972. Um, and uh, we understand that moment is a kind of inflection point within Rudolph's career. Um, he had already been chair of the School of Architecture at Yale from 1957 to 1965. Uh, he had completed the Jewett Center at Wellesley in 1958 and the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, building in Boston in 1961. And he also completed the AA building at Yale in 1963. So all these buildings had sort of led up to this moment. Um, and, he, and also the, the, um, the Tuskegee University Chapel in 1969. So when he interviews for this project, he's, he's at the height of his career, if we, if, shall we say. Um, and um, I wanted to re, you know, reflect on something that Timothy wrote in his book that Rudolph was a star architect you know, at that moment. Before we conjoined the term star architect to star architect, which we have today, he was a star architect. And Time Magazine in 1960 referred to his the, um, this comet you know, across the architectural skies or something. Um, so this imagery of kind of a meteoric sort of rise, but also a kind of meteoric uh, fall. You know, and uh, it's known that after 1969, there was a fire at the Yale Architecture School. It was rumored that the students set the building on fire themselves, which is hard to believe. Um, but I wanted to reflect on, on the kind of inflection point in his career um, and um, maybe uh, ask uh, our panelists to, to reflect on how did this building fit into Rudolph's arc, maybe? Uh, how you might read that um, and that moment, because it wasn't just um, one building at a time, it was against a kind of cultural backdrop, you know, politics, 1968, um, uh, Vietnam War. I think that was alluded to this morning, but maybe each of our panelists can help us understand this building within his oeuvre and within the, against the cultural backdrop of the time. Um, th that's, that's, a, that's a point that is always raised in discussions about Rudolph, the trajectory of his career. Uh, um, it was an extraordinary career um, that rose as as um, Eric mentioned, like a comet, according to Time magazine. And then it seemed to have a precipitous decline. But Rudolph's career really epitomized, um, exemplified the rise and fall of post-war American architecture. And he rose and kind of fell with it. And he also rose and fell with the fortunes of um, a rise in the building of um, academic buildings, for colleges that were expanding in universities, institutional buildings of all kind, the vast expansion of post-war America, and also the vast expansion of, of post-war religious buildings, um, because, and Alice is an expert on this, can tell us more, um, we think of that as, sometimes you think of that as a period of a return to, or a, develop, a development of a more secular culture, the 50s and 60s. I'm not so sure about that. There was a tremendous building of religious Built, of uh, the erection of religious buildings. And Rudolph, as I think we'll talk more about that later, was really well equipped. In the late 60s, early 70s, when Rudolph gets this commission, his career and his fortunes are changing along, shaped by what the larger cultural forces. Um, there is a growing distrust of big institutions, which he's invested so much in building for universities. <laughs> Um, government, all he's put all his eggs in that basket. He really was not a corporate architect. He did not work with businesses that much, just a few instances. Um, but the institutions he's working with are being questioned as they are today. Um, he's also um, one of the leading figures of post-war modern architecture like Aero Sarin and Marcel Breuer. And that's being intensely questioned, especially the period when this is being built. Um, when this is finished in 1972, a very important book was published, Learning from Las Vegas by Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. And there are, there's passages in that book, pages, where Rudolph is questioned for the monumentality of his buildings, for their being gestures of very high modernism and authorship. And so Rudolph is working with all this. And Eric very nicely brought in the fact, and I was thinking about this too, is that um, there was a fire that devastated Rudolph's, the building he was most invested in, I think, the Yale um, Art and Architecture Building, in June 1969. Um, he never talked that much about it because he was very much, he's not a person who um, 
was expressive. He was expressive as an architecture, not personally. Um, but I, I wonder if that was kind of in his thinking as well, in the background of his mind, that he got this commission to rebuild a structure that had been d destroyed by fire, and his own building had just been destroyed by fire, and he could barely go back and look at it. Um, and he had many commissions, but some of them were sputtering, like the Boston Government Services Center, which was never completed, um, and was terribly abused, I think, by the city of Boston and the federal government. And um, those things are, are going on, but they are beginning to crumble. The commissions are beginning to crumble under his feet as there's big shifts in the economy, in the way we regard architecture and all these things. But I've said enough, let me turn it to Alice as well. well thank you, Tim. Um, and uh, while you were talking about Rudolph's changing fortunes, I remembered that I was on the committee at Wellesley to uh, pick the architect for the new Davis Museum and Cultural Center. And it's um, adjacent to and connected to the Jewett Art Center. Uh, that building was completed in 96, I think. Um, so we were in the midst of this search process or this consideration. It was an open call. Any architect could submit their work. Um, and so we had, you know, the trustee's niece or nephew, and we had all these sorts of different folks that put their work out there. And we ended up, in the end, choosing the architect, um, Spanish architect, Rafael Maneo, for his first American, his first American uh, building. But one of the struggles, I would say, one of the touch points was what to do about Rudolph who was still very much alive. Um, and, you know, what seemed at that point he was doing these vast mega structures with multi enormous size and multiple parts in a, um, I think it's fair to say in a style that was no longer considered fashionable or desirable, a kind of modernism. And so, as I was reflecting on this as Tim was speaking, I was thinking, I did actually meet Paul Rudolph, um, who with great dignity came to Wellesley College knowing full well that he had been asked to give a lecture but was in no way being considered for the new museum building. And he gave a wonderful talk. Uh, he, it uh, was in the 90s and, um, about his building and as Tim said, the times had changed, not just in architecture, but in every other way. This morning service we heard and thought a little bit about the time of 1968, which you know, began to unpack and question many of the things that in our current era are of you know, de decolonizing and de-racializing as we call it in academia, but you know, uh, those years were a time of, of questioning the large institution, including the sort of, in, in our field we call it the, the program, what the institution or the client wants to have happen in the building. And at the Jewett Art Center in the mid 50s, remember it's finished in 58, the idea was to have an arts center where art history and music and theater uh, and the museum would all be under one roof. And it's that sort of mega institution, even on a small scale, um, that then was, was, let's just say, all of those coherent notions of the arts or of government or uh, other institutions of size were being fragmented and thought of on a smaller scale. Um, so I was, I, was, I was reflecting on, I don't think it's a sad story, but I think it's a story of, of change um, and how um, Rudolf didn't give up. He didn't change with the times. He, uh, I mean, Tim knows all the, his career much better than I do, but it, when I met him, he was, uh, let's say, maybe it's appropriate for this space, 
unrepentant uh, <laughs> about his views on architecture. And, um, you know, a man with ramrod straight bearing and great dignity uh, addressing you know, the Wellesley that was then 15 years later, no, sorry, 20 years later, a very different place than it had been when he was there as a young man at the outset of his career, sort of dictating the course of the world, as were his clients, Wellesley College Art Department and uh, my f former colleague of many years ago, John McAndrew, who had been at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, and all of those institutions were being uh, questioned, let's say, as they should be, but they were. Uh, oh, you have your own back. So I'm thinking Rudolph's career actually was at the peak when this was commissioned, which I thought was interesting because I read that he had warned the congregation that he was a controversial architect when they were hiring him. Um, I also think it's interesting that, you know, the fire in 69 really, along with the book that came out critiquing his work by some of the people uh, writing about what later became postmodernism, he stuck to his guns even though his commissions dropped away. Um, I work with Ernst Wagner who lived with him for 25 years and there's not a day that goes by when he talks about how the fire impacted Rudolph. Rudolph's office was at 200 at that point, goes down to about 50, pretty much overnight. And Rudolph starts designing small residences and uh, three Macy's that we know of that I still can't locate in the United States up here somewhere. Um, so to go from that kind of large career to that overnight practically um, is interesting because he takes an opportunity and when his model shop was not busy because he didn't have models to build, he started making furniture for himself and light fixtures and would then put light fixtures in all of his projects and design them by himself and using his staff to make them. And that later turned into a company known as Modulator, which later grew and became the building and the place where now my office is and where eventually the institute that I run will inhabit the building and turn it into a study center, which Rudolph actually wanted to have created when he died, um, which didn't come to pass, unfortunately. But he always was taking an opportunity and so I think, and he always said, I will design anything for you as long as you let me do it really well. <laughs> and so I think that this was an opportunity that he couldn't turn out, couldn't turn down, but he could tell that things were slowly going the other way for him. And uh, it apparently did eat him up pretty much from what I've been told. Thanks for those reflections. I, I, as Alice was talking, I was thinking like, maybe we're at that moment again, you know, maybe we're, kind of returning to a moment where all institutions are being questioned. Um, and maybe that's you know one reason why maybe there's a, a kind of new resonance with uh, his work today. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case, but um, I wanted to you know shift to maybe a reflection on the reception of Rudolph's work um, at the time by official critics, by the general public. I think um, one of the terms that he's most associated with is the term brutalism, which I think um, there's a kind of effort to sort of recast as maybe heroic, and I see Mark Pasnick's here, um, and and the effort to sort of um, you know to rethink that moment. You know, was it really about brutality, or was it about a kind of um, expressive, uh, an expressive project for architecture to sort of reinvent society, which is you know maybe another way to think about it. Um, but we also hear a lot about um, you know some of the buildings under threat. Uh, Rudolph buildings under threat, buildings from the 1960s under threat of demolition. Um, I think, you know, Alice's mention of, you know, you know, why are we tearing down buildings, you know, today, um, and thinking about um, our new uh, sort of consciousness about, you know, the built environment, its sort of footprint, its use of energy, its embodied energy. I think this moment of adaptive reuse and, you know, addition as opposed to uh, demolition and subtraction, a kind of tabula rasa moment versus a kind of incremental change. I think that resonates with our time. Um, and I wanted to maybe ask uh, each of our panelists to reflect on, you know, Rudolph's um, preserving of the ruin and adding to it, adding another layer to it, if you will. Uh, and is that, is that a kind of early instance of a kind of ethos of reuse that is somehow 
sort of newly sort of resonant with our current sort of um, consciousness of, of architecture and, and the built environment. So maybe we'll start with Kelvin, go back this way, but uh, to reflect on, on questions of preservation, conservation, you know, what do these buildings uh, say to us today and, and how can we think about them, you know, uh, anew, maybe? Sadly, there's not a year that goes by without a Rudolph building probably being torn down these days. Um, I got involved with the Institute, which used to be known as the Paul Rudolph Heritage Foundation, uh, back when it was also the Paul Rudolph Foundation. And that was in 2006, the first time that we had dealt with a house that was torn down since Rudolph had passed away in 97. And unfortunately, it's been nonstop ever since. Um, it's rare that I get to go to see a building that's very well maintained. So, and I've gone to see a lot of them, probably about 36 or 37. I try to go to one every year. And uh, when I came here, I didn't know what to expect because I only saw the outside. And I came from down the street where I could see the steeple. And then I saw the rose window that was missing. I think part of it was still there that's no longer still there. And I saw the support that was holding that part of the wall up. And I thought, well, this can't be Rudolph. This is crazy. Why would he leave this? And then <clears throat> when I was knocking on the door, this guy let me in and he goes, oh, you must be a fan of architecture. Walk around, take as many pictures as you want. And that's when I got to see the inside. And what I find fascinating is, is I think Rudolph wanted to leave part of the building behind because it's, it's, a, it's part of the history of the site, it's memory, but he also gives him something to riff off of, which was kind of like to show that it continues, that things grow and they change. And that was his idea of modernism, was essentially the difference between classical architecture, which is a church where you walk down the center aisle and it's symmetrical and you've got a rose window at the front, a rose window at the back, versus modernism where it's off-center, it's got modern materials, the lighting's a little different, you don't have as, you know, the windows are different, there's technology that's changed. Um, and so I think that that gave him the opportunity to kind of play those two off each other. I think similarly, there's some unbuilt projects that he did, I'm thinking of New Haven Government Center, which was not built, where there was a part of the original that was that's still there actually, but had his building been built, he insisted, just like with this one, that the part that was historic remain and that his building would be built around it and the roofs and the windows were to riff off of the facade and the roof, the steeple roof, very similar to this one. Um, and I am kind of glad that those skylights did not get built that were supposed to be here. I think it looks much better without them. The skylights did get built if you ever go to Niagara Falls Public Library in a slightly different form. Um, and they leak, so it's probably best they weren't built. Um, and, uh, but I do think, you know, Rudolph wanted uh, modernism and uh, to, to be referential to history, and that was something that Rudolph really falls in between the two. He's not a modern architect in the sense that you throw it all away and start new, although he could do that. He's not someone that takes a classical building and just, you know, puts some paint on it. But he really wanted to do something down the middle, and I think this building kind of shows the possibility of that. As far as history and preservation are concerned, I will just remark on one thing and then turn the mic over to um, Timothy again. Um, because I, it was a I want to just reference a discovery um, of today for me, and that is I had a little stroll down the back alley and realized that we have, it's a, it's a brilliantly planned building so that the character of the back of the building, which houses so many of the functions and the school and the um, parking and all of these things, um, doesn't in any way detract, it's sort of hidden, it's like a little magic box. It doesn't detract from the, the stately beauty of the, of the, um, of the um, front on Marlboro Street. Uh, so that's one thing I was thinking of. Um, and of course that is about history because it's about the character of the neighborhood, right? And when this building was being thought about, 
uh, in the 60s. The, it was a very different sort of place, certainly, than Back Bay than, and Marlborough Street and Commonwealth Avenue than it is today. But the preservation of the scale and of the importance of the building on its site and the tucking in so beautifully of the um, functional spaces on the back. And remembering, you know, this is sort of a preview of what I will say about post-war spirituality, but that the church is a place of community and it's a place of learning and it's a place of gathering, it's a place of talking. Those are all post-war ideas. Um, and there's, a, of course, a ton of program as we say, <laughs> that's tucked into this building, but you wouldn't know it from the, from the beautiful facade. Um, I will also just quickly say that Rudolph, as a young architect, uh, when he planned the Jewett Art Center, and when the pandemic is finally, finally over and you can go into our building, please come out and, and do so. Um, it's a building that is on what we call the academic quadrangle at Wellesley. Most of it is brick Gothic revival buildings, administration and uh, hit, you know, learn, study buildings or learning classroom buildings. But Rudolph's new building is in constant dialogue with those historical Gothic revival buildings. Not only is it made of brick with um, concrete trim reflecting the materiality of the existing buildings, but it, uh, many of the features, the brickwork, the lancet windows, these little thin windows, um, and other features, including its very, very peculiar staircase, um, are reinterpretations and reflections of history that he got into a lot of trouble with about four in the, in the 50s. You know, modernism was not supposed to be about history, and brick was not really a modern material. And uh, so, you know, from the day I walked onto that campus until the very present moment, when we teach the beginning course on art history, the one week that's about architecture, usually is late in the spring, just a beautiful day like today, where we have the students stand in that academic quadrangle and do a visual comparison, speaking of looking at buildings, and re recognizing all of the ways in which the Jewett Art Center talks to the historical Gothic Revival buildings across the quad. And that is, dare I say, you know, the, one of the, that and the planning of the alley facade, I would say are evidence of Rudolph's enormous talent as an architect. Um, back to you. Thank you. Um, and, and I'll add to that, that one thing I always notice when I come here is I look at the church across the street by Pietro Belusky, who's one of the great post-war architects as well. And he was a friend of Rudolph's and a great help to him in his career. Um, Belusky built maybe 50 churches. He was an expert on church architecture. Um, that church is beautiful and I love it. But that is really the 50s approach. Um, it has very little obvious relationship to history, though there are all sorts of cues and things like that, and very little contextual relationship to its surroundings. That's the 50s, it's like mid 50s or so. You look across the street, this is the late 60s, and things have changed in the world once again. I mean, Rudolph was often called like somebody who was aloof from his surroundings in society, a formalist, but somehow his work really, increasingly so, we notice how it ties to all sorts of changes in society and in architecture and across the board. So this is like the moment when the preservation movement is rising all across America in response to urban renewal and in response to the heartless urban renewal of cities. And Rudolph has been participating in that as well, but he gets this ruin and he uses it and he understands it and he likes it and he does not demolish it. So I think it's a moment that signals the rise of preservation, but his preservation is not to preserve things in amber or to restore them. Like he could have mounted a project suggesting the restoration of this space as it was to make it much more like it was, but he didn't do that. And he had a history of regarding 
older buildings as interesting artifacts to relate new buildings to, going way back into the early 50s, even before the Jewett Art Center. He had this great project for an embassy, a US embassy in Jordan, and it was on this site where there was three old buildings, like vernacular buildings built by um, um, the inhabitants of the city, maybe 100 years, before, maybe merchant houses. And instead of knocking them down, he was going to leave them and then wrap the new structure around them and put them in a garden and build a canopy over them. And he was going to use really interesting um, um, local limestone, replicating some of the techniques used on, in, in Jordan since Roman times. And that was part of his interest in masonry. He's going to weave all these things together, and yet it was not going to be a copy of any old building. It was still going to be a modern building. So it was very sophisticated, actually. I think, what he was doing, and, and thoughtful and engaging with um, history in very creative ways that we could learn from today. So let's move on. Nice. I think it's another, another way it resonates with this moment. Um, I think we wouldn't dream of tearing down buildings like that um, at this moment. Um, maybe I, I'll touch on my last sort of, um, sort of topic that I wanted to think about today with you is the uh, question of religious architecture. Um, I understand that Rudolph designed 10 religious buildings, although most of them were not built. Um, First Church sits between two other religious buildings in his body of work, the chapel at Tuskegee in 1969 and the Canon Chapel at Emory 1981. Uh, and I read an article this morning that Justin provided um, where Carla Kavara Brighton and Daniel Ledford Note that these chapels are, quote, among the most daring and inventive and least known works. Uh, and First Church maybe seems to fall in that category. It's not well published. I was looking for articles about uh, the, the building and plans. Um, and I also read that Paul Rudolph was the son of a Methodist minister. He sort of grew up around the church. You know, it seemed that his familiarity with the church sort of equipped him with how to think about organization, community building, organizing uses around space. Um, but I'm also struck by how he sort of organized our, our sequence when we came in, coming off the street, sort of spiraling around, almost discovering um, this space in a kind of cross axis of where you might have traditionally expected it. You might have expected the nave to run this way, but he sort of reorients the church in order to sort of wind us around. And then the way he sort of structures the space with the light coming in over here and the clear story over there, um, I think he was masterful in in using material and space and experience, maybe theatricality, to sort of construct this experiential um, uh, understanding of architecture. Um, so maybe that is to say that um, he's putting all of his interests in architecture sort of to use for designing religious buildings. Maybe this is a kind of a fit between a program and a project for Rudolph, uh, where he was doing monumentality and in, in housing he was doing ornament in the Jewett Center, say. But here he sort of brings it all together for a common purpose, maybe this idea of being together in, in a space or being inspired in a space. Um, so maybe um, I could have each of us sort of reflect a little bit about his approach to religious architecture, how do his techniques, the sort of larger projects sort of coincide with, with this project maybe. Um, and then maybe we could hear also from uh, the audience afterwards uh, some of your reflections about how does Rudolph's um, project, shall we say, um, resonate within this particular typology and within this building in particular. Good question. <laughs> trying to think of what to say. Um, I have seen, I, I've not been to Tuskegee, well, although I've seen lots of photographs of it, and I think this is, I, I almost think this is a better successful project than Tuskegee in some ways, um, although Tuskegee's much larger. I think they're actually pretty sim similar in a lot of ways, um, the way you enter, and, and uh, the, probably the religious project that I like the most, though, that is not usually considered one, is the um, student center, the Christian Science Student Center, uh, that was torn down. Um, they all had this kind of scale of intimate spaces where Rudolph always draws these renderings of people sitting in the space, in the chapels. 
and they, he draws every little head and every little body of the people in the pews. Um, and so uh, they're always from the back looking forward and they've got this wonderful attention to detail. And uh, the, 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 that was fascinating in the sense that it was a small building, but yet wrap, it was functions wrapped around essentially a double height space. And in that space, when um, people were, and I don't know if this is true, maybe you do, Tim, know this, that he painted the ceilings because in case people got bored and looked up, they could uh, see some colored ceilings. Um, I heard that. I don't know if that's true. I don't see any colored ceilings here, but I do like the uh, copper. Um, and so, you know, Rudolph did have a lot of experience in churches, but also he, he described them in ways of... Um, a story. So, for instance, the one that you reference in Emory, he's in a documentary talking about how the building is coming at it as if they're in covered wagons coming from the four corners of the earth, and they meet, and they create this kind of hashtag form, and so the barreled vaults kind of go off into the four corners, and then the center space becomes this, the communal space of the chapel. Um, and so he was always interested, but again, none of those have windows. None of those are looking outward. They're always turned inward. And which I find fascinating, and that is, I think, a common theme in some of his religious work. Oh. <laughs> well, I think um, there's lots of things to say about Rudolf and spirituality, or spiritual spaces, one of which I think is the program of the church and all of the things that go on in it was something that he understood in, in the post-war. But I want to also allude to two things. Uh, uh, Eric mentioned that Rudolph was the son of a Methodist minister and he was a Southerner. Um, and I think he understood very well uh, the life of the spirit. A, recognizing that there are two parts. So um, Rudolph loved the architecture of Le Corbusier, uh, the great um, Swiss slash French modernist. Be, and he talked about the way in which space unfolds in Le Corbusier's work. Um, but we also can see in, he, he lo loved and learned a great deal from Frank Lloyd Wright. But he, if we think about it also, uh, the ways in which he understood not the quiet part of the spirit, but the theatrical part of the spirit, of the life of the spirit, the sort of the beauty of light and the drama of space. And, you know, even coming in today, uh, the low ceiling that then opens into this beautiful expanse of soaring spaces where light guides you and... Um, I should say, you know, no matter what's happening in, this, in the service, or even if you're in here on your own, there's a lot to look at, and there's a lot to react to emotionally. Uh, Rudolf was a student of history. Uh, he loved Michael, the work of Michelangelo. So in that sense, he understood, let's call it drama and rhetoric and the clashing of symbols and the uh, angling of spaces. This is such a beautiful sanctuary. And it's so meaningful, I think. Just sitting here, <laughs> I'm having a very nice time. Um, uh, because, you know, there, in some of his buildings, the concrete uh, seems hostile and aggressive. Here, it, it's almost like a soft corduroy. Uh, it's called corduroy concrete or bush hammered concrete, all these terminologies that we have. Um, but there's, um, it's a very loving space, in it, but it's also so dramatic uh, and meaningful. And Eric talked about the way he guides you through this path from the outside to the inside. And then when you get here, it's like, there's no, you're, there's no confusing what's being said here. It's very glamorous. I've gotten into trouble in the past talking about the glamour of religion, but of course anybody who has ever been in a church and felt the spirit knows that shiny things and red things and light coming in and music, the beauty, beautiful music we heard this morning, 
uh, all of those things, if we put the word glamour aside, it creates a theater that Rudolf understood as a student of history, but also there's a performative aspect of it, let's call it, um, that, you know, uh, is very different from the feeling you get across the street, you know, of the severity of sp the spirit and the severity of the discipline of the higher power. And, you know, this space has a dance to it that I think is deeply moving. Thanks, Alice. That was really beautiful. Um, and you set some things up beautifully for me to continue expanding upon. Um, let's face it, Rudolf was probably in his heart a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think. I think so too. I think he's a post-Reformation Catholic of the 17th century. He wants to be Borromini, and that's what he really loves, and it's Baroque architecture, and this is Baroque architecture. Um, that's what it is, folks. And the best, one of the best interior spaces in Boston and religious spaces is the chapel designed by Rudolph in the Lindemann Center downtown. It is a miracle of curvilinear, sinuous forms in the most sensuous concrete you've ever seen. And it is lit from above like a Baroque chapel or like the ancient Roman pantheon, and it is gorgeous. And hardly anybody's ever seen this. You should make it your mission in life to go see this. Um, it is hard to see, but it should be better seen. I, you know, Rudolph grew up the son of a Methodist minister. It's so interesting how many of the great canonical architects, American architects of the last 200 years were the sons of ministers. H.H. H. Richardson, Frank Furness, um, Rudolph, um, I think there's another that is escaping me right now, but there's a bunch of them. And that, and Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, how could I forget? And Rudolph has this parallel, many parallels with Frank Lloyd Wright. They both loved music, played the piano, the sons of ministers, and so that those were the models. Um, and I think that, you know, this, this all fits very well into a larger program of Rudolph's, which is that he finds modern architecture when he comes of age in the late 40s and early 50s to be, as it was practiced in America, reductive and overly functional, concerned with the right angle only, the curtain glass wall. And he finds those things very unsatisfying. And he says it in his writings. He, had, he gave a talk here in Boston in 1953 for the American Institute of Architects Convention, where, and he was, and people who said him, he, who heard him speak said he was like Jesus in the temple <laughs> decrying the money, money lenders. And he spoke out against the established, the established modernism and said it had to be more emotional. And that's what he was trying to do. And I think that it, it chimed for Rudolph in many other ways. Um, I think, you know, he's not practicing religiously. He doesn't, I don't think he's a regular churchgoer as an adult. I think he leaves established religion behind and joins into the more secular culture of the 1950s and 60s. But architecture is, is a place to express emotion for him. That's what he really thinks it's about in spirituality. He's also, um, you know, a homosexual man in the 1950s and 60s, um, dealing with a society that has become, is at, at almost the height of its homophobia. And he knows that to be revealed will be disaster for his career. And he, he believes that until his death in the 90s. He never publicly comes out. He cannot. It is too difficult. And we really have to feel for him. Um, so architecture, I think, was people say that we should not read too much biographically into architecture, especially these days. Um, oh, fooey. Oh, fooey. <laughs> OK. But I think that there is something that Rudolph could express through architecture um, that was very full of meaning, that could resonate beyond his own self, that was not just personal and idiosyncratic and individualistic, but could touch upon the feelings of others. Now, he could not always cue exactly, he did not know what the emotional response could be. So something that was emotionally exciting to Rudolph and fulfilling and beautiful could be actually frightening to other people. So, in the end, it's an emotional roller coaster, his, his buildings. Um, and, but this, this one is really at a very nice moment on the roller coaster when you've gone up, but before you've gone down. So, <laughs> Rudolph and emotion and spirituality.
Thank you. Thank you for those responses. I wonder maybe now we might turn to the audience and see if there's any um, reflections from the audience of um, how you've experienced this building over time. Uh, does the light come in differently or uniquely on a winter day or a summer day? Um, I'd love to hear from the people that occupy this building uh, throughout the year in, in different lights than we see today, maybe. I'm John Benson. I'm a member of the congregation here and actually currently one of the trustees. Um, I first experienced this building at the time of a colleague's untimely passing in 1973, having only seen it in architectural magazines before that. But what I'd like to call your attention to today is to look up and see the copper ceiling and the light. It was stronger this morning because when we have services on Sunday mornings, the daylight is always shining off the back wall of the church as long as the sun is out, and everyone has that experience to share. But uh, even today, it is inspiring that Rudolph oriented this church the way he did. You forget your orientation relative to Berkeley Street or Marlboro Street once you've entered the sanctuary because you've made so many turns. But you don't forget your orientation to the sun, and that makes it an inspiring place to be. I can't remember the last time I spoke through a mic, but I, I, this is a little aside. This isn't really intellectual comment, but I, I lived two or door, three doors down, 72 Marlborough Street, in a loft, something out of Gertrude Stein, and or down and out in Harris, Paris, in London, an old lofty kind of Barney kind of apartment. And I heard this church going up in the morning, you know, the, 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 the workers outside. And if they weren't hollering at each other, to be hitting each other with their tools, I'm sure. But it was exciting. I heard this clang, clang, work, work. And it was exciting because I felt like I was having a new home being built. It was beautiful. I've been going to this church since I was a baby. I'm Anathal Reno, by the way. And that's my husband, Dave Reno. Okay, I, uh, more later. The next chapter. I, I'd like to say that I've come here with Anna and I've enjoy the church. I think the word that comes to mind is intimate. And I did not know that he was um, homosexual or used the term gay, but I do find it interesting that his uh, creation was done in the form of a building rather than children. So this was his baby and he does leave a great legacy. I'm sorry to see that his buildings have been torn down because uh, we seem to wait until things are torn down like Penn Station and then say, oh my goodness, look at what we've lost. Fortunately, Jack, the late Jacqueline O'Kennedy NASA saved Grand Central Station but from being turned into another Penn Station. So maybe we should preserve, and dear heavens, we're Unitarian conservatives. We want to conserve the past. What a comment, what a concept. I had a question as the minister for the last seven months, eight months. Can you figure out what might have inspired him to put red neon light bulbs up there in the towers? <laughs> Do you want to? Go ahead. I can't say for certain because he didn't actually say it, but I know it was published that he considered that to be his stained glass in the windows, that that was his version of it. Um, I did see pictures of it that were published of it outside of the building, which looked pretty striking. I don't recall seeing them when I've been in here before on the interior, though. You can see them all the way to the comfort car. Interesting. Hi, I'm Ben Sabatini. I'm visiting for a couple days here. But every time I come to this church, it's really inspiring. And I want to talk to Kelvin a bit about the demise of Paul's work and what's going on in Boston right now with all this glass architecture. <laughs> so every generation has trends, right? 
And why do you think Paul's work was not looked upon favorably and torn down? Was there a different trend that was being developed in the, in the, in the country at that time? What do you think? I think it's a small, I think it's a part of it. I do think that, you know, his buildings with a lack of windows and people want windows, that is going to be a problem. I do think that for most of them, it's been maintenance. I mean, uh, the problem, and this is what I do primarily at my job, is to go to sites, talk to people and say, and this one's not one of them, thankfully, your building it could use a little bit of help and I need to, you know, let's talk about how we can get the community involved to remember what it looked like when it was first built, when they were excited to see something new. I'm thinking specifically Niagara Falls Public Library where they're roping part of it off and they want to sell it to a developer. I'm thinking of what's going on with the Boston Government Service Center right now. And I'm thinking of a couple of homes out on Long Island. The trouble is, is Rudolph, for all of his wonderful design skills, designs complicated buildings and complicated buildings are complicated to maintain. And I think that Rudolph's reputation has come around full circle enough that it's not so much that Rudolph is hard to live in as much as it's hard to maintain. And so this building, I was very happy when the guy that I first came and met, and he showed me around and he told me about the Rudolph Red, and I love that. And he told me about how much they loved the space and they were taking care of it. And he was so proudly showing off all the work that they had done, talking about the roof, etc. I wish that happened more often, but more often than not, I talk to people that don't know what the building was built for, don't know why they built the building there in the first place, don't know how to maintain the building, don't know where to get the money to maintain the building. And so that's why we lose buildings. It's mostly through neglect over time and then later it becomes an eyesore and the community turns against it at that point, um, unfortunately. I, the style, I think, is some of it, but not as much. And I could add to that. Sorry, I'll come back to you. Um, in the, in the um, handout, there's a wonderful interview with Bob Campbell um, that Justin had a conversation with Bob a few weeks ago. Uh, and Bob Campbell, who's the Pulitzer Prize winning critic for the Boston Globe, or was until recently, uh, he makes a similar comment, you know. So I would just refer you to that quote in there because um, Justin asked Bob what he thinks about contemporary architecture in Boston, and he says, uh, development in Boston today is just horrible. <laughs> There's a lack of ambition. Everyone does a glass box. It's a city of glass boxes. You have to be able to recognize one building from the other building. It ought to have a face. It ought to have something you can see. They're all interchangeable now. So I think there is a shift. You know, we're going to see a shift from from... You know, I, I had a chance to interview um, Gerhard Kalman and Michael McKinnell, the architects for Boston City Hall, and they said um, if they could have made the light switches out of concrete, they would have. But that was because they were reacting to what they regarded as a flimsiness in modern architecture, the candy wrapper architecture of the corporate era of 1950s. And so they wanted something with some integrity, with some solidity, with some permanence. And I think that's what Boston City Hall does. That's what this building does. Um, Gerhard Kalman had another comment at that moment. He said, I hope I'm alive when I'm rediscovered. <laughs> because he knew that these things were cyclical. He knew that that was currently at a low point, but that there was also a kind of upswing to the kind of uh, appreciation for this kind of architecture. So I hope we're on this upswing um, and that the architecture in Boston will change to reflect our sort of contemporary values. Anyways, please. Yeah, I had a question about um the use of the space acoustically. Um, I have a couple of friends who have performed uh, in theater companies in both this space and in the chapel. And I know, you know, we rent. I'm a member of the church, and we rent to many different um, classical music uh, companies. And have always heard back that acoustically, it's really quite a striking space. And I, I, I didn't know if that was you know, a happy accident, if that was specific to what Rudolph wanted to do for this particular environment, or if that was um, a common denominator among other of his um, sacred buildings or other buildings. Um, it's, it's, 
It's a tricky subject, acoustics, and I'm no expert on the field, but it is a growing field of historical of scholarship, um, and they would be the experts. Um, I, you know, it's, I think a lot of it's just chance um, with acoustics, but I think Rudolph did have a sensitivity to it because, as I mentioned, he actually, he was a pretty accomplished musician who thought about becoming a professional pianist. So he had an understanding of music, grew up with church music, and the chapel at Tuskegee is, chapel is a misnomer, it's a very large building. It was built for the Tuskegee Choir to sing in, which was a famous choir in the 60s, especially during the Civil Rights Movement. And um, so it was supposed to amplify sound. And so I think there is some sensitivity towards acoustics and there's happy accidents and it all came together here. Um, I have a question for Cal Kelvin. Can you hear me? And um, this has to do with a project that I just love. It's outside of Boston. It's the, the campus of UMass Dartmouth. And I'm just wondering if it's been several years since I've been there. Um, and I was wondering if you could share an update of how, how those buildings are faring these days. We were just there actually last October, I think, right? For a brutalism conference. Um, Tim and I, they're doing really well. And yeah, it, it's amazing. They've replaced the carpeting. They've taken care of some of the spaces. They've got a new group called UMass Brute, which they've created specifically to promote the, the campus. Um, and they're, in a, they're getting an amazing number of followers every day on Instagram. The, uh, I, that's one thing that I encouraged the, the library up in Niagara Falls to do, um, was to reach out to the community bring them in and share stories about what it was like so that the stories when people remember and talk about, you know, with students for instance come up to me or people that work at UMass and they say, I know where that picture's taken and I remember this and they remember all those hallways. You know, it's so unique. So they get, they get so touched by it when they work there. And it was an amazing space because much like this space with all the nooks and crannies and different levels, I was able to make, uh, I was able to do a talk in a, and it was projection on a wall just like behind us here, as the sun was going down, about Rudolph's use of terminology in his spaces. He used words like nest and cave and cove. And he didn't think about it that I could find, except he did write it down in some of his drawings. And you see parallels in a lot of his architecture, UMass Dartmouth, the various levels that are here, almost ge uh, geology-like construction. Uh, and so, yes, it's very well taken care of, and it's very good, and I love going up there all the time. Um, um, I have a comment, and maybe Edmund can uh, chime in. A lot of us, you know, obviously we're doing research about this uh, for this 50th anniversary, and we also um, have the pleasure that the music director that was here during that time period, his family is still extremely involved. So um, there's a, and we had the woman speak today who was the head of the selection committee, uh, Becky Richardson, so she's 88, so that was pretty neat. But the story uh, is, is that they, uh, Leo was a, a doctorate, had his doctorate in music, and um, he, I think Rudolph made the organ was going to be in the back. Edmund, you'll help me with this. It was going to be in the back. And um, Leo said, and his, you know, his family, his children, and his wife was still alive. Yeah. So his, his, uh, he spoke to um, Paul Rudolph and said, no, we have to have it in the front. So the, the planning of the music, and still, we have all professional musicians. I'm here 25 years, much before I ever came. So um, the music was a centerpiece of this church, and he listened. I don't, do you remember the dialogue or something? But there was, or Becky said it, I don't know, but there was a dialogue between them, and he listened and talked to them and redesigned it for them. So I just wanted you to know, yes, it was definitely a plan. And who is next? Uh, 
Hi, I just wanted to follow up on what Fern said to say that they were very focused from the beginning on both that, that the space worked for words and music and they worked with Bolt, Baranek and Newman um, and that was something that kind of came from the uh, some members of the congregation saying they need to, you know, you need to get with the sound engineer now kind of to, and I don't, I don't know the details, but, but BBNN was involved. Um, and I also just wanted to add a story that I was told by Margaret Shepard, who is the calligrapher who originated the Copper Strick Strip project um, and, and wrote the names in 1999. But she told me that there is a thread back to Rudolph um, that her idea came from being told that at the time that the ceiling was being sheathed in copper, there were these little scraps and strips, whatever, and he started playing around with them and poked some of them into the striations, which for me connected with photographs we have of the dedication ceremony where there's all this copper stuff going on on the wall behind where you are as though there were sort of copper streamers or something. And I thought, but, you know, it doesn't look like these. They're not as deeply pressed in, but there was something. And as Margaret Shepard told it, and she didn't see this, it was told to her, she said that he'd, he'd put them in and then everyone reverently left them there. You know, the architect did this, it's part of, you know. And he returned six or seven years later when he was brought back as a consultant on the chapel, when they wanted to do some changes in the chapel, and apparently said, no, 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 you know, I didn't mean for that to be permanent. That was, you know, that was just kind of fooling around. And so they took them all out. Um, but it stayed, you know, when she heard the story, she thought, you know, I like that idea as a way of bringing the membership in. And I want to add to what Fern said. If you look on your order, not order service, your program, uh, you'll see a sketch, which is not the as-built sketch. That's an early sketch. It has something, a roof, a ceiling that doesn't look at anything like this copper monolith that's impending on us and threatening to crush us all. Uh, it, it's, it's got all kinds of other things to break up the light in it. And it also has a symmetrical, a more or less symmetrical balcony structure. And that was before they put the uh, organ in front, as was just related to you, that, that, that this Rudolph said, oh, an asymmetry. He sort of embraced it. To have a, 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 it's hugely asymmetrical, um, but it also, I think, kind of works in here. Who else? Who else is up in there? Hi, my name is Aaron Goldstein. Um, I've been studying Paul Rudolph and brutalism, her heroism uh, for a while now. And the thing that I'm noticing the most or even commented on during the tour before this was the different gradation uh, that you see of the building just looking down into the, um, into the parking lot. And that's something that I've, I was just over in, uh, in the Bay Area in San Francisco and I saw a lot of that especially um, on college campuses and things like that. And I, this is for everybody on the panel. Um, what do you see with that here? How does that transfer elsewhere in Boston, Massachusetts, um, in other cities that you've been to? Um, how have you noticed those things? Aaron, could you say again, you noticed gradation? Yeah, so you have below grade being in this case the garage and then things that are above grade, and there's a lot of play with that, especially as you look um, into the shadows, into the light, um, just looking at the, at the facade. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Well, one thing that's clear, I agree with you entirely. One thing that's clear is that Rudolph loved the vertical dimension of, of buildings, the different levels. Um, in fact, he also, I think, was very interested in the sort of drama of danger in buildings, you know, that from the top to the bottom was it could be precipitous. And um, in Jewett, for example, there's slots of space, let's call them, where you get to the edge of a floor and he didn't, we had to change it because you would get to the edge of the floor and there would be no parapet to keep you from <laughs> suddenly 
being on the first floor when you were on the third floor, especially uh, little kids who could go under the, the space under the stairs. And so the college came along and put up these horrible barriers so that you can't see through. The space doesn't unfold the way he wanted to. But I think you're onto something. If you come to do it and look, even the, the outside, uh, there's enormous differences, very dramatic differences, and he used those uh, to fit more program in, but also to create more drama. And uh, I think that's very, very true here as well. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I think you're right about noticing these many changes and variations in level and integration of things like parking garages, subterranean features. It's not just Rudolph. It's the architects of the 60s who were doing that. Um, it's part of a reaction against the planar qualities, the one-dimensional qualities of post-war international style. They're very interested in the earth and getting down into the earth and excavations, the bulldozer comes along, all sorts of things happen. And, um, and you see this also at Boston City Hall at the plaza and the building has multiple levels. And as Alice said, it allows them to tuck in more program, parking garages, all sorts of services. Um, Rudolph loves to put a building on a platform. He did it a lot um, and that, he likes to put it on top of a parking garage and they were all really interested in parking garages and they had to be because people were so afraid that cities would lose their viability unless you had a lot more parking and um, that's, that's what happened and so this is a way of handling that. Today we don't do that. Um, things are much more unilevel, <laughs> less, less of this layering and I think it's because for very good reasons, um, safety, Americans with Disabilities Acts, all sorts of things have leveled things out, but it, it does, unless it's in the right hands, it can contribute to the one dimensional quality of a lot of contemporary architecture, so. I think you'll find that Rudolph criticized a lot of architects for designing in plan only, and he thought that planning had to start with section as well as in plan. Um, and so consequently, a lot of his buildings are criticized for being overly too many stairs all over the place. Um, Yale being a good example, the art and architecture building, he put in stairs at every other level. When you turn a corner, you've got three steps up to go or three steps down. In our building, we have a lot of, uh, in New York City, we've got a lot of steps that kind of randomly split into two different directions. And the reason for that is because Rudolph, for two reasons, I think, first off, well, three reasons. First off, he wants you to stop and he wants you to take a look at where you're looking and then where you're going. And every time you turn, you have to look and see a different point of view. Secondly, Rudolph didn't, in some of his buildings, use a lot of walls. He suggested by having steps in, in our building in New York, for instance, a bedroom doesn't have a wall separating it from the living room or from another bedroom, except you go up a step or down a step. And I think that was something that was happening with conversation pits. I love conversation pits. Rudolph didn't use them enough, unfortunately. But um, he did do a lot of steps for that reason to suggest space. And um, that was something that he did critique others for not thinking of enough. I, I heard a rumor that uh, the Yale School of Architecture has 29 levels. Is that true? Yeah. Um, which is kind of amazing because it's like a six-story building. Yeah. Um, and then I've heard a story that frankly, Wright, when he filed a permit for the Guggenheim Museum, filed it as a one-story building because it's a spiral ramp. Um, so those are two approaches to architecture and section that sort of play with our sort of sense of, you know, a kind of normative unit of, of, um, of a floor. I wonder if we should, we'll take one more question from the audience and maybe we should wrap up and go outside and enjoy the beautiful day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all this. Um, I'm a member of the congregation and when we were having, um, oh, okay, okay. So when we were discussing this, and I started to look up Paul Rudolph on Wikipedia, and um, I saw that he was described as a precisionist. And I'm wondering, is that a really accurate architectural term for, for him? Because it doesn't, s even though it's very precise, there is, it's, there's a more of a softness organic part to this. So that's just my question about the term precisionism. 
Thank you. It's all yours. Yeah. Um, when, once again, proof that you should not use the Wikipedia as a resource. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, that's a funny term. I haven't come across that. Precisionism means something quite different in American painting of the early 20th century, and it was a very precise way of painting. Um, that term did float around again in the 60s, 50s and 60s, amongst, amongst some architectural historians we know of. Um, the, precision, the, precisionist, the precisionist strain in American architecture by Jordi, I think, right? Yeah, and um, so maybe, I don't know, but yeah, yeah it is, it's very specific if you want to use that as a synonym for precise. I don't know if that word I would use per se, but I do know someone told me once that Rudolph was very concerned about making sure you understood how his buildings fit together, the joints and the, the corners. Um, I'm thinking of my building in particular where he kind of overloads you with corners with the idea of that's by having so many corners in a space because your mind looks at a space if it's especially a rectangle and searches out the corners to know how big the space is overloading the space with corners gives you your mind a sense of a lack of scale and that was something that he was interested in in our building where we only have a 20 foot by 100 foot deep lot um, I don't know if precision though to that degree would be the word that I would use as much as he was concerned about the construction so that the person could look at it and get a sense of gravity. He wanted people to know how the buildings stood up, how they were composed, and then he would use material to shift past each other to kind of suggest movement in space, but I don't know if that's quite precise. A precise definition, maybe. Okay. Maybe with that, we should, uh, we should call it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for having us here. And, and Barbara, who's asked the next to the last question, I think it's in the second row of the back, uh, she says she will run a tour for anyone who still wants one. Uh, just meet with her in the back of the, uh, of the room. Thank you all for coming up. Thank you.